Let's talk about the cestodes or the tapeworms. As a brief overview, the three different type of cestodes that you need to know for USMLE and Comlex are Tania solium, Diphylobothrium latum, and Echinococcus granulosus. These have a lot of information, but we're going to boil it down to just a couple high yield things that you need to know because 99% of your board questions or your exam questions are going to hit a certain buzzword and so you'll see that buzzword you'll remember this video today and you'll get the free point so let's start with tania solium so risk factors for tania solium are areas with poor access to clean water now clinically this is going to cause two different diseases there's the intestinal tapeworm and there's neurosister cercosis the intestinal tapeworm causes kind of vague, asymptomatic, um, or mild, nonspecific GI symptoms. And you don't really need to memorize that. But what is important to know, and is the most important thing to take off this slide, is that the intestinal form of the disease is caused by ingestion of larvae, which is typically an undercooked pork. Whereas in neurosister cercosis, that is due to the ingestion of eggs in food that's contaminated with feces. And so that difference between intestinal form of the disease is from larvae in pork and the central nervous system part of the disease is due to eggs in food contaminated with feces. That's really high yield. That's very important because they'll give you either pork in the question stem or contaminated food that's not pork, presumably with feces, they may give you the eggs and you'll have to differentiate what type of disease you're dealing with or what type of symptoms you expect to see based on the etiology. So you have to memorize that and I'll show you a mnemonic in two slides. Neurosister cercosis is the, two, is the disease of these two that you should be familiar with and it causes central nervous system symptoms. So seizures, and ring enhancing lesions are the big one. It can also cause things like intracranial hypertension, some neurocognitive deficits, headache, stroke, focal neurological deficits, or involuntary movements. But if you see this presentation and somebody has these nonspecific neurological symptoms, they're gonna show you the image on the next slide, so stay tuned. Diagnosis here is made with stool microscopy. So in O&P, you directly visualize the proglottids. Now, if they're going after neurosister psychosis, and I would venture to bet that if they're gonna test you on tania solium, they're going to go after neurosister psychosis because again, the intestinal tapeworm, while that can be serious, it just causes mild GI symptoms. And so it doesn't really make for a sexy exam question. They're gonna go after neurosister psychosis. They're gonna show you this picture. And what you see here are calcific granulomatous ring enhancing lesions. And if you've been studying at all, you probably are aware of the fact that there are other disease processes that have absolutely nothing to do with this pathogen that are also causing ring enhancing lesions. And so by going after this parasite, the test writer can force you to differentiate what you see here against other causes of ring enhancing lesions. The other thing to keep in mind here is that you're gonna see all of these cysts, but the cysts are not always gonna be super big because when you have the formation of these cysts in the central nervous system, you get perilesional inflammation. And what that inflammation does is it actually reduces the size of the cyst, but that leads to residual calcification, which can cause more neurological symptoms. So understand that if you see this image, you are dealing with tania solium, and specifically you are dealing with neurosister cercosis. The eggs were in, contaminate, were in contaminated food, contaminated by the presence of feces, causing neurological symptoms, causing ring enhancing lesions, and that is going to show up in certain buzzwords as well as this image. Now, going back to this slide, again, I think the most important thing for you to take away from tania solium is one, that you've got this thing called neurosister cercosis and it causes ring enhancing lesions that appear all over the brain like this image and two the difference between the intestinal form of the disease and the central nervous system form of the disease depends entirely on what the person is ingesting are they ingesting larvae from undercooked pork or are they ingesting eggs from fecal contaminated food. And so in order to memorize that, we need a way to associate larvae 
with pork and eggs with food contaminated with feces. And so what I want you to remember is Porky Pig or Porky Pig. So Porky Pig is a character from Looney Tunes and I changed the name to Pork A Pig. Pork A Pig, if you say it really fast, it sounds nice. And what the A-E in Pork A reminds me is that larvae are what are found in pork and if it's found in pork, you're going to eat the pork and get the GI symptoms or the intestinal form of the disease. So pork a pig helps me remember larvae and pork. And then in my head, I go, okay, well, if pork is larvae, then that means that the eggs are the fecal contaminated food. So that's Tania solium. Lastly, for treatment, you're going to use praziquantel. The important thing to know for exams is that if neurocystic sarcosis is present, and again, if they're going after tania solium on your exam, it's going to be present, you have to treat with albendazole. So just know that little nugget of information. Now let's move on to diphylobothrium latum. Diphylobothrium latum, I want you to think DBL. D for the D in diphylobothrium, B for that B that's like halfway through the word, and then L for latum. This will make more sense in just a moment. Diphylobothrium latum, or DBL, is due to consuming raw or undercooked fish, which gets infected with larvae. And if you're a fish enthusiast and you're like, ah, please tell me what type of fish am I dealing with? It's perch, pike, burba, whitefish, salmon, and trout. So typically cold water fish, although not always. Now, something that's really interesting uh, is that DBL is one of the largest, if not the largest parasites that can be found in humans. So if you look at an image of this, it can be up to 15 meters long. It is very long. Clinically, what you need to know for your exam is that it causes B12 deficiency. And this is going to look identical on your exam to other types of B12 deficiency. And what I mean by that is the test writer is going to give you labs. You're going to see an increased MMA, an increased homocysteine, and an increased mean corpuscular volume. You're going to see a decreased hemoglobin level. You probably will see a decreased B12 level, although they may not give that to you because that obviously gives away a B12 deficiency. And if they show you a peripheral smear, you will see hypersegmented neutrophils and megalocytes. So the DBL parasite causes B12 deficiency. And so on your exam, the test writer might start to describe symptoms of B12 deficiency. They might describe for you subacute combined degeneration. In your head, you're already saying, okay, I think this is B12 deficiency. What are the very high yield causes of B12 deficiency? And then out of left field, there, here comes this parasite. And you didn't see it coming because of all the things that cause B12 deficiency, you know, honestly, diphylobothrium latum is kind of down the list. So you have to remember on your exam that when you start to work through these questions, if it's a third order question, you got to be able to pair it with DBL. Treatment, praziquantel. Now, what I want you to take away from this, and obviously the most important thing, the highest yield fact that will get you the most points, is that DBL causes B12 deficiency. And so for DBL, you got to remember DBL, debt B12 low. All right, that's all you got to know. DBL for diphylobothrium latum, debt B12 low. Let's talk about echinococcus granulosis, and this will conclude the video. So the reservoir for this one is dogs, but risk factors are areas where there are dogs or cattle. So dogs that are used to herd cattle or protect cattle, that's a risk factor because again, dogs are the reservoir. Human infection occurs when humans ingest eggs in food that's contaminated with the dog's feces. So again, being around dogs or on farms or areas where dogs do things like herd cattle or sheep or whatever, that, that's a risk factor. Clinical symptoms. So generally, echinococcus granulosis is going to be asymptomatic. However, the way that this works is that it causes the formation of something called hyatid cysts. And they grow slowly. Initially, they're fairly asymptomatic, but as they grow in size, they, they exert a mass effect on surrounding organs. And those organs that they impact include the liver, the lungs, spleen, central nervous system, and bones. And so when the cysts start to become symptomatic, the disease, the presence of that is called cystic echinococcosis. And in you know, most often this is going to be in the liver. So if it's in the liver, you'll have symptoms clinically such as abdominal pain, decreased appetite, hepatomegaly, 
there could be a palpable mass or abdominal distension. Now, if this occurs in the lungs, you know, ask yourself, what symptoms would I expect to see if there was a growing cyst in the lungs? Unsurprisingly, those symptoms are chronic cough, chest pain, and shortness of breath. So really what's happening here is that depending on the organ that you get or that where the cysts go or the hyatid cysts go, you get mass effect symptoms. And that's what's probably going to show up on your exam. Now, because this is most common in the liver, expect to see symptoms of mass effect in the liver. So again, GI pain, decreased appetite, hepatomegaly, palpable mass on exam, etc. And then the treatment here is albendazole. Lastly, just be familiar with these images. So if you see either on imaging the presence of multiple cysts in the liver or grossly this image that you see with calcified hyatid cysts, you want to be thinking about a kinococcus. So be familiar with these images. That's all. Good luck.